Thank you so much, and thank you all for being such an attentive audience. If you didn't tweet already, make sure you do. Women are so powerful, and there's just not enough time. They're going to take their photo, and I'm going to segue us to our next panel. Our next session is on women's empowerment and leadership in decision-making. The reality is women remain systemically absent from a lot of our political structures and political leadership. So how exactly do we ensure participation in the leadership of women, both in this country and around the world? Our next panel hopes to answer that question. So I'd like to welcome to the stage Michelle Bernard, she's the president and CEO of the Bernard Center for Women, Politics, and Public Policy, as well as all of the panelists. They can all come to the stage now. Let's give them a round of applause. I think we're ready. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Let's wake up. We can do better than that. <laughs> I'm Michelle Bernard. It is a pleasure to be here with you today. I'm going to very quickly uh, introduce, um, introduce our panelists, and then we're going to get right into it. Uh, so first, um, Kat, if you could just wave to everybody. Um, Kat Katrina Fotovat is the Acting Ambassador at Large for Global Women's Issues um, and is currently the Senior Official to the Secretary of State in the Office of Global Women's Issues at the State Department. Thank you. Um, Mandana Dayani um, is the creator and co-founder co of I Am a Voter. Round of applause. And Eric Holder is senior counsel at Covington and Burling, the 82nd United States Attorney General. And since we are talking about women's empowerment, I would be remiss if I did not state that he is also the husband of the wonderful Dr. Sharon Malone. So we're going to get started. The first thing I want to do is just um, run through the uh, what has been said as the five components of women's empowerment. One, a sense of self-worth. Two, the right to have and determine choices. Three, the right to have access to opportunities and resources. Four, the right to have power to control one's lives within and outside of the home, and five, the ability to influence the direction of social change and to create and to create a more just and equal society. Um, so from that, we want to start with an international perspective, and I wanted to go to Kat first, um, because uh, it has been said that the status of women is typically defined by the status of a democracy. Uh, in a country, and I know that you've been doing some important work on democracy promotion recently, and I wanted to ask you a little bit about what you're doing, and also from your perspective, what do we mean when we say the status of women is determined by the status of a democracy? Sure, thanks for that question, Michelle. Hello, everyone. First, I want to thank the Women's Forum and, of course, Vital Voices for having this wonderful event and forum. Um, so the Biden-Harris administration, this is our um, first anniversary of what we call the Summit for Democracy. And that is really looking at and making sure that we are being as inclusive as possible, partnering with other governments across the world to make sure that democracies are being uh, promoted, that we are looking at rights, that we are making sure that as we we are building out and supporting our democratic processes, we include women. So yesterday, we actually had an event um, basically called the status of democracy, the status of women is the status of democracy. That literally, I wanted to make a t-shirt out of it. I wanted to make sure that, and really that comes from the fact that we cannot have a full and functioning democracy if all members are not included and they're not able to access their rights, are not able to provide input into their communities and their countries. And certainly women as 50% or more in many countries of the population must be included to make sure that you are having the most um, inclusive and innovative approaches to the work that is being done in countries, to make sure that representation is clear, to address the challenges and barriers in families and communities. So we need to make sure that that, uh, 
that ability to access um, democracy and principles in which women are able to participate meaningfully in their communities is something that is being um, prioritized. So that was something that, um, and when we're looking across the board at the different areas, we focus on three primary areas of inclusion. So we're looking at women, peace, and security issues, and I know that we just had a um, panel on uh, women in conflict. You know, we know that women, if women are not included in peace negotiations, peace negotiations are 64% less likely to be successful. We know that if women are not included in businesses, we have seen through the pandemic, which has absolutely um, provided the data to show that when women are not included in um, economic empowerment and economic viability, um, countries don't do well. Companies don't do well. That economic case has been made time and time again. And then looking at gender-based violence, we always say nothing about them without them. You cannot talk about uh, survivors and talk about solutions to conflict-related sexual violence or, or gender-based violence writ large without including the, the stories and impact on survivors. You must have their voices included in order to be effective. So this is effectiveness. If you want to make sure that all a boat's rise together, you must include all people in that discussion. And we mean women in all their diversity. We are looking at making sure that we're including indigenous women, women with disabilities, making sure that we're including racial and ethnic minorities. So having those discussions and being inclusive and looking at the challenges and barriers and meeting women where they are is really the focus of the work that we do. Um, you cannot have or build something together if you're not using both your hands. Again, we're talking about 50% or plus of the population. Women in many countries are far outnumbering men in terms of education. We're not seeing that reflected in terms of management levels in many companies or in um, governments. Um, so making sure that we're providing those that uh, capacity building um, in order for them to participate meaningfully you know, the United States government, we're very proud of this, is the first government to ever legislate and mandate um, UN Resolution 1325, um, which really promotes women's leadership, um, women's participation in peace negotiations, but again, we need to make sure that we're implementing, resourcing, I can't say that enough. You know, President Biden often says, show me your budget and I'll show you your priorities. We're very proud to say that um, the Biden-Harris administration doubled the amount of gender funding. So we went from $1.3 billion to $2.6 billion in funding towards gender. So we are trying to lead and we're trying to make sure that this is something that we are um, making sure to highlight and prioritize women in democratic processes and we need to do that through resourcing, make sure that they have accessibility, capacity building, and make sure, and I hope all of you help me on this, that their voices are heard. So we're also looking at things like technology. Um, think about everything that you do right now includes technology, and that is something that you know women have to have safe spaces to be able to operate. Um, they are constantly being attacked. Um, there is disinformation, misinformation. Women in leadership positions are constantly being attacked, so we need to provide safety and access um, and training. Um, um, so these are some of the areas that we look at when we talk about making sure that women are included in democracy. So um, thank you so much for that. Um, a a follow-up question. Women's inclusion is how we, we reach women's empowerment. But I, I also want to talk about and ask you, what is it about when we add women to the equation when they have been excluded that changes the dynamic? Like, I, you know, I have read stats on the State Department's website, for example. When you add women to the equation, we see, we see things differently in terms of attention to human rights, attention to racial, uh, you know, racial justice, gender justice, um, peace, um, voting. What is it about women that, that, what is it about the way women think and lead that leads to those differences? I mean, that's a great question. We've seen, you know, when, when women entrepreneurs um, are able to access finance, they are 50% more likely to hire other women. We know that when different perspectives, I mean, diversity is important. And this is really about building an equitable and equal society for all, including men and boys. And we need to, you know, make sure that we bring in men and boys as allies as well. I have a son. You know, my son will constantly tell you that he's happy to let women run whatever they want. <laughs> um, so, 
you know, I'm I, my feminist son, which is my life goal, um, is is very empowering in terms of making sure that you know the new generation is really looking at things from that equitable perspective. So it's important to bring in people that have different life experiences. It's important women across the board are more likely to think about um, areas that could affect their communities, their families. Um, they're more likely to bring funding back if they make money back into their communities and their families, um, looking at things like education. Um, so we know that there's different perspectives. That's not to say male perspectives aren't absolutely important. And we have amazing, look, I mean, I'm sitting next to Eric Holder, who <laughs> 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 was an amazing male champion. So it's just so important to make sure that we bring in all these perspectives. I'm going to give one example, actually. We um, So the Afghan girls robotics team, who I just absolutely adore, um, we recently saw them um, in Doha um, last year. And it was interesting. They were talking about their robotics that they were making. And my son also does robotics. And it's so funny because he just makes robots that just knock everything down. Uh, you know. And so when we were talking to them, I was like, show me your, ro your robots. And one of them pulls out a robot that literally during COVID, it was actually disinfecting things. And oh. what an amazing, I was like, this is what a girl does versus what my son does. You know? <laughs> Again, both important perspectives, but you know, making sure to bring in that different perspective on you know how how different you know different men and women and you know uh, gender gender diverse persons as well LGBTQI we want to make sure that we are being inclusive and pulling in all the in innovative ideas um, and in, you know it's so important that diversity is included so we all do better. Thank I you. also just add that I think Dion said it best last night: women get shit done, and <laughs> that has always been real. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to turn to our male panelist. And speaking of men, though, I have to talk about my son also, who I'm raising to be a feminist. And he's a freshman at Howard University. And I was on campus with him one day, much to his chagrin. And he was wearing a T-shirt that says, protect black women. Um, which I love. And so many of the girls on campus were walking up to him just to say, you know, thank you for being our partners. And we know as women, we can't do this alone. We have to have men um, in the battle with us. So Eric, number one, thank you for being, for being here with us today. We have a little competition going on. My family's from Jamaica. Eric is from uh, Barbados, from, from Barbados the, the, which he accuses of being... Um, the pearl of the Caribbean. <laughs> The, the second pearl of the Caribbean. <laughs> but, but Eric, talk to us about it from your perspective, because we, we, we can't do this alone. And we are so happy to have you as, um, as a brother in arms with women um, as we fight for women's empowerment. And, and at your work, um, with regard to your work at the Justice Department um, and other things that you're doing, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the disenfranchisement that we see or attempts that we saw um, going into the 2020 election to disenfranchise women voters. Um, and I guess we call that gendered, gendered voter discrimination and, and why that is harmful and what we can do to remedy it. You know, it's interesting to hear Kat talk about all the things that the Biden-Harris administration is doing, and that is, I think, something, a, a cause for optimism um, and, you know, their attempts to do things on a worldwide basis. But I'll tell you, I'm very worried about the state of this nation yes. um, and where we are with regard to um, women's rights, women's empowerment. Um, you know, our, our system has always been gerrymandered, something that we've been trying to fight. I'm the chairman of the National Democratic Redistricting Committee, and we've tried to, in this last cycle, make sure that the redistricting was done in a fair way, not to favor Democrats or favor um, Republicans, although I happen to fear, feel as a Democrat that if it's fair, you know, progressives, Democrats, we'll do just fine. We don't have to put our, you know, our thumb on the scale. Could, could you just quickly, just ex just a one-liner, explaining redistricting for our international audience? Well, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, the United States um, draws its legislative lines every 10 years, the year after we do our um, constitutionally mandated census. And on the basis of those lines, um, you can draw them in such a way so that you favor one party over the other. You can create what are called safe districts, which almost makes it impossible for another party um, to win, and that's called gerrymandering. Uh, and if you look at these gerrymandered districts, they look very strange. You'll pack you know, certain people into one area, weakening their influence in other places, or you'll split people up so that you weaken their influence in, in that way. And um, so we've been fighting um, gerrymandering. I'm concerned about that and the overall impact that it has, but in particular, um, the impact that it has on women, and especially with regard to the most um, basic choices that women have reproductive rights. Um, you see, after that abomination of a Supreme Court opinion that overturned um, Roe versus Wade, 
uh, state legislatures, gerrymandered state legislatures, passing these um, anti-choice laws, no exceptions. You know, there's one in, I'm going to be campaigning in Wisconsin now. There was a Wisconsin bill, the operative bill that controls um, the right to abortion in Wisconsin was passed in 1849. Roe versus Wade is overturned. That law, that old law, now becomes that which controls in um, Wisconsin, which is why I'm supporting a woman to be the next Supreme Court justice in um, Wisconsin, which would flip the court four to three and then come up with something more modern. I think that deserves some applause. <laughs> but these gerrymandered legislatures are doing things inconsistent with the desires of the people in the various states. If all the polling that has been done shows that in every state, every state, no one wanted Roe versus Wade overturned. Now, the margins are different in Texas, say, as opposed to, you know, to New York, but in spite of that popular feeling that Roe kind of got it right, um, these gerrymandered state legislatures, again, people who can do things inconsistent with the desires of the people who they represent, but again, because they're in these safe districts, don't face any electoral consequence, have done a whole variety of things to take away from women that, that, fundamental, that fundamental choice. I, I think there is a, and, and you look at our history, there is a fear of female power of women power. Um, when we started this great American experiment, um, you know, I, I wrote a book, it's called Our Unfinished March, and it talks about how different groups uh, obtained the right to vote. If you look at the founding fathers, they wanted the first people who they wanted to give voting rights to, and the only people they wanted to give voting rights to, were white men who owned property. And then, you know, so it was a big debate about that. And one of the, John Adams, our, our second president, actually says, well, you know, if you give, if you decide to give voting rights to people, to men, and only men, men of, other than men who own property, other groups will demand the right to vote. Women will demand the right to vote. So, you know, I mean, oh, horrors. And so from the beginning of this republic, that has been something that we have been, um, dealing with, trying to, to work through. And uh, as I said, I think there is a concern that women empowered um, will in some, will, will, will challenge this male dominated, male created status quo. And that creates fear, um, you know, fundamental fear in the hearts uh, and minds of uh, of many people who are, you know, in, in control of, of so many things. I'm just res restricting myself now, you know, to, to this to this nation. Um, and that's why, you know, in fighting for um, a fair system, um, we have, I look at the NDRC, um, <laughs> when we have, we get around the table, there are more women than men um, at the table. And it's an interesting thing, you know, in the hiring selections that I made, I was always looking for diversity, um, but also looking for advocacy, you know, people who do good advocates, people who had, I thought, a good worldview, um, people who were good organizers. And it was just kind of, I don't know, it, it struck me. It, it, it also struck me when I was uh, AG, I remember looking around the table and there were more women there again. And uh, Again, not with a conscious decision to say, I want to have women at the table. I do. It, it just kind of, if you just kind of let things naturally happen, and if you make decisions, hiring decisions on the basis of competence, commitment, um, organizational skills, women seem to float to the top. So it's a question of removing a lot of artificial barriers, um, political barriers, um, dealing with... Um, you know, stereotypes, in the same way that we are dealing with, um, you know, when you're dealing with people of, of color, you know, there, there are barriers that have to be, um, have, to be uh, have to be dealt with. But, uh, so I'm worried about where, where we are as a nation, um, about our democracy generally, but specifically with regard to how this democracy regression is gonna have an impact on, um, on women. You know, it, it's an interesting thing. My wife, I am in fact Mr. Sharon, that's my <laughs> official title. Um, she's an OBGYN and um, my daughters have fewer reproductive rights at 29 and 27 than their mother did, um, you know, at, at a similar age. And so what, is, what does that say about where we are as a nation? You know, I will, um, I will mention there are two cases pending before the Supreme Court uh, in the South, two Southern cases now, um, that I think could have a great impact uh, in putting up new barriers where we see Southern states 
um, attempting to redefine for purposes of the census what it is to be African American, um, which think about that, that's quite bizarre. Um, but if, if these two, two states are, are, are winning or win before the Supreme Court, if you are Afro-Latina or Afro-Latino, you are no longer considered black for purposes of the census. And that is another, you know, another act of structural racism that will make it more difficult and I think ultimately have a negative impact um, uh, on women. Um, particularly in the South. Yeah. I mean, I think the reality is that, uh, and I think it's consistent with what Kat was saying, that fair governmental practices, um, you know, strong democracies um, rely on women and also empower women. And um, that is why I am as concerned about this, you know, just on a very personal level. I mean, I'm, I'm the father of, of a son, and he would probably be building the destructive, you know, <laughs> automatic thing there. And um, and two daughters. And I worry about what is the world that I will be leaving, you know, to them. Yes. Um, I'm worried about where we are as a nation, you know, right now. This is a um, a democracy challenging time within the United States, and it this generation cannot fail um, in its defense of democracy. So, um, so we have to talk about I am a voter. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about I am a voter. You and I were talking earlier about sort of different generational differences um, in the way that we look at voting and the importance of voting. I think that there is no one um, here who would who would say that um, that voting creates issues. I mean, not voting creates issues. Um, I love the work that you're doing. Why don't you tell the audience a little bit more about I am a voter and and just trends that you're seeing. Um. So I, um, I had a very untraditional background. I started as an attorney, worked as a talent agent, then worked in fashion for a long time, and tech. Um, I came to America, um, technically, I guess, as a religious refugee um, from Iran, where I was born. And I was on uh, parental leave when I saw the child separation happen at the border. And see, you, know, you see yourself reflected in other refugees. And I remember when I arrived in New York, despite the journey and how traumatic it was, uh, coming to New York and seeing the bright lights and, not, and just how foreign everything felt, the only thing that got me through that was holding my mom's hand and knowing that like I'm going to be OK. To see yourself in these families, to know that we took children away from their parents, that we lost children, we orphaned children, we honestly treat luggage better than we treated those children, um, was horrifying. And I got on a plane, I went to Tornillo, Texas, which is where the first camp was, and I just needed to see it. You know, one of the, the weirdest things that happens in the media is this narrative that about immigrants, because I've always believed immigrants are the most patriotic people in America. Like, I always was told that America saved my life, we had flags everywhere. Um, my mother says it all the time. She came here from Jamaica and always says, greatest nation on earth and has given us the chance to do everything yeah. that we've accomplished. Yeah. And so I'm standing there and I'm looking at this camp, you know, obviously someone who's Jewish that is traumatic for many reasons. And I just was like, something is broken. Like some, we've lost something, um, to your point earlier. And I didn't know what to do. I just knew that I had all these skills and I was advising all these companies and I had helped build so many brands. And so I started meeting with congressmen and senators and trying to figure out, can I help you with messaging? Like something is lost in the messaging. I feel like we can do better. Um, and everyone said we needed higher voter turnout. And I was like, that can't be hard. I mean, we sell six mascaras a year to people and make them think their lives are gonna change. How many Marvel movies do we launch? Like, how can it be so hard to get people excited about something? And I realized we hadn't put in that effort to bring people into the fold. I feel this way a lot of the times as I engage with DC, right? Like, we don't do a great job of communicating to people in a way that they understand. We use these big acronyms, they don't make sense. We stand up and we share these 10 point policy plans without being like, hey, by the way, that means you pay less for this medication and call this phone number. You know, Doing the work so people feel included in the process, so they understand what is happening for them, like that government works for them. Like we see so much dysfunction. And I think women particularly just feel so discouraged when they feel that dysfunction over and over again. And so we, I think, just generally need to do a much better job of showing the wins, showing government functioning, bringing people into the conversation. Um, and so I called 20 women that I um, 
had worked with in my career, I think some of the best uh, talent agents and entrepreneurs and founders, and we all sat at a table and, and we really, as <laughs> ridiculous as this sounds, started to think of ourselves as publicists for voting. You know, how can we change the way people think about civic engagement? Because it really is one of the most powerful acts of resistance, solidarity, patriotism that you can have. Um, and we just hadn't really shown it, I guess, in that way to our generation. And so um, I always believe to, you know, if you want to inspire people, you need to go where they are. And so we went to hundreds of consumer brands and entertainment brands and sports teams and fashion brands and the CFDA and everyone. And, you know, I sent out this email and so did NCA actually, the talent agency joined as our co-founders. And, you know, I remember sending this email and I always have this thing where I think like no one's coming to my birthday party. So I was like, oh my God, I'm going to email everyone I know and tell them to do this thing and everyone's going to think I'm crazy. And everyone said yes. They said, and they were like, thank you for asking. No one has ever asked. And everyone showed up. I mean, and, and you know, we really looked at I'm a Voter as this big community service project where like, you know, I've done this pro bono for five years. You know, it's everyone was like, what can, what do you have? You have free ad space, give it to me. You have windows, you have store merchandising. Can you give me the bottom of your menu at your restaurant? Bumble, can you push out an app notification? The NBA teams gave us jumbotrons. I mean, everyone had something to give. And using these brands and these icons that people are inspired by to really elevate like what being a voter is and kept it really nonpartisan. And so for us, it really became about creating these digital tools that we felt could be customizable for brands and talent, um, anyone on campuses to participate in a way that felt really fun and exciting and engaging, um, really inclusive. Um, it's the most uh, rewarding work I've ever done in my life. Um, but it was, I mean, obviously predominantly women that showed up yeah. um, and continue to show up and, and offer everything that they have to make this work. And, you know, I think sometimes people feel intimidated by making that leap into um, this type of work. And I always say, like, we need you, right? Like, people showed up and they were, I'm a graphic designer, can I help? Yes. I'm an accountant, can I help? Yes. Everyone can help. Um, and, and doing what you're good at is so incredibly valuable to the process. Tell us um, a little bit more about the reactions of women or just what women are telling you about reasons why they, they are not engaged in the process for those who are not. Well, you know, we focus a lot on, I would say primarily on young voters and women. Um, and, you know, I think on the Democratic side, you hear, you told us to vote, we voted, we flipped, you know, the House, the Senate, the, the Oval Office, you know, 90% of us want background checks, you didn't get that done. Um, and that's hard. And I think sometimes it's about explaining that change takes a long time, that, you know, you can't just go to one march and think you're going to get all your rights. Like, you got to keep showing up for your rights and your democracy, that that responsibility is handed generation to generation. Um, but I do hear a lot from women, you know, particularly in local elections, because I think that's, the, you know, where we see the least participation. And... You know, there's so many women that I have had these very frank conversations with that are, you know, the PTA moms who coach the soccer team and monitor how much TV their kids have and plastic they use, but they don't vote in local elections. And it's so confusing because I'm like, you're not choosing who the superintendent of your school district is and the sheriff and the parks and recreations in your city. I mean, all of these things that actually do impact your child, you're just not participating in. Um, and I don't know that they know that, you know? I think this comes back to the inclusive um, education around, you know, I always talk to people, like, your politicians work for you. They don't have a job if they're not doing a good job. You're just, you know, this accountability component um, is, I think, really missing. And by the way, we don't do a really great job of teaching civics. So, I mean, I think that makes sense. But. I mean, that's a really good point because the reality is on a day-to-day -day basis, your life is more, more impacted by who serves at your local government and your state government than who actually is the president of the United States. Now, it doesn't mean that, you know, I'm not saying that Joe Biden's unimportant. I don't, don't think that at all. I mean, he's obviously vitally, vitally important. But uh, who your city council person is, who is your county representative, who serves on your, your school board, these are all um, people who are vitally important, as I said, on a day-to-day -day, um, basis. Um, one of the things that we've seen in the, the last several um, election cycles is that black women 
continue to come out in droves. They are the most reliable voters, um, particularly in the Democratic Party, but also in the Republican Party. Like we, we are there, we vote in enormous numbers, but are still the most disenfranchised. So, uh, Eric, from a from a, a legal perspective, how is that a, how is that a barrier? Like, how do we tear that barrier down? How do we change that? You know, it's interesting because as we have done, I've been the head of the NDRC now since I guess January of 2017, and so we do all this. Whole I'm, I'm going to interrupt you again. You're doing DC speak, as Mandana oh, would say. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> head of the I, think National that I see people smiling. They're saying, "What is the NDRC?" Yeah, not to be confused with the NRDC, but no, <laughs> which is a re the National NDRC is the National Democratic Redistricting Committee, and it was formed, as I said, to deal with the problem of, uh, of gerrymandering and making a fair redistricting process in 2021. 20, uh, but it, we've now, it, you know, if you do that, you have to focus on a whole variety of things. And, and among the polling things that we've done, the people who are, it's interesting, most persuadable, who were most impacted by the messages that we sent were, were women. And the ones who were actually persuaded and then acted upon that persuasion were, were more likely women. And trying to get out young people. Um, young people in the United States now make up the largest voting block in the country. I mean, baby boomers, my generation, they've been we've been superseded by in sheer numbers. But we have, that is, baby boomers have more power because we vote in, um, in far higher proportions. The key to unlocking all the polls tell us, our polls, tell, keep unlocking the youth vote is to get young women. Um, some come up with messages that will impact them because they will listen, they will then act upon the, the effective message. Guys, hear it, and you'll get some return on that investment you know, of the message that you have sent, but you get a far greater return um, impacting um, women. And so we have tailored a lot of the things that we have done for, um, you know, for women, and it kind of brings guys along as well. And I was just going to add, you know, we, I felt like when we started, we said we wanted to target young voters and, and women. And they were like, no, they're non-voters. They, they drew me the circle of non-voters. And I was like, that's not a real thing. You can't just not target people because you've classified them as non-voters. We'll help them vote. Um, and there's this thing where they just say like, oh, the youth just doesn't care, which again, it could not be further from the reality. I mean, this is the generation that I actually think cares the most. They, I mean, the way that they understand their purchase power, I think the latest statistic was 87% of young Americans won't buy from a brand that doesn't advocate for their values or goes against something that they believe in. I mean, they understand the, the power of their dollars very well. And we've seen this in consumer purchases. You've seen this happen with so many massive brands and how young voters have taken away their money from, you know, Adidas to Nike, you know, and showed up for Nike. But we just haven't shown them how that applies in voting. And I think, again, this is more about us changing the narrative and showing the wins, showing the impact of voting, being able to show stories about how much people in politics, right? Like th this administration is doing such an incredible job. Um, and I just think we need to bring young voters in. And I, I, I think this whole narrative that they don't care is so damaging. And can I just note also, um, just one of the biggest issues, again, is disinformation. And yes. the misogyny has been commoditized. There are so many people making money off of misogyny right now. Yeah. The amount of clickbait that goes in, mm -hmm. the amount of you know just disinformation across the board, which is really the threat. So yes, people want to be involved, but often the information they're getting is wrong. Um, often the information they're getting is scary and just you know bringing them into you know the the wrong you know uh, perception on on how to actually effectuate change. And that is something we all need to educate each other on. Um, I think going back to your point about we don't do a good job on civic education, absolutely. You know, it was one thing I always tell, would tell my son was exactly about local politics. I mean, when we would go out and see, have a pothole, no offense, but he would say, thanks, Obama. You know, like... <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, At least he didn't say, thanks, Eric Holder. I mean, <laughs> but making sure he understands... It was Barack's <laughs> problem. It was his fault. No. Yeah, so that they know, you know, President Obama had nothing to do with the pothole in the ground. So, you know, making sure people understand how those linkages are made, making sure we're talking to, you know, teachers are just, you know, undervalued, underappreciated, underpaid, um, and making sure that we are supporting them and being able to create citizens across the world, you know, who are able to advocate for their countries, their communities, their families, and themselves. Thank you. Um, we're going to turn to Q&A. Um, right here, I'm going to go here, here, 
I'm coming to Brown, but we'll start, we'll start right here with you. Um, I have a, a, a comment and a question, but maybe to talk more directly on the young people's participation in voting. It seems to me that many states actually restrict the voting for students. It is almost impossible to vote on college campuses, right? Yeah. So I had heard, maybe I'm wrong, that you could use an ID from the NRA as voter ID in Texas, yes. but your student ID at the at one of the state universities was not valid. So could some of you comment on that? Because again, I think they do want to vote. It's just impossible. Mm -hmm. It certainly made, I'm, I'm not sure I'd say impossible, but certainly made more difficult. The point that you raise, in fact, is true. In Texas, um, after the, the Shelby County case, it's actually Shelby County versus Holder, but it's such a terrible case, we never call it the, the Holder case. It's, it's the Shelby <laughs> County case. Um, <laughs> A lot of the protections of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 were taken away, and photo ID, it was something that was introduced to, to combat this non-existent voter fraud. And in Texas, yeah, if you showed up with a, a state-issued photo ID that says you had the ability to carry a weapon, that was fine. That, you, that would show your identity. If you showed up with a state-issued photo ID from the University of Texas that said you were a student, that was not fine. And uh, so there is that. And then there are polling places that did exist um, on college campuses that after the Shelby County case w were closed. Um, I talk about North Carolina A&T, uh, largest African-American um, you know, college, historically black college and university in the nation, was split. In, in, in half, two different congressional um, districts. You know, if you were a, a sophomore and you lived in this dorm, you were in Congressional District 5. If you were a junior in this dorm, you were in Congressional District 6. You had to register, re-register, and all those kinds of things. And the, uh, the young people there, actually a young woman named Love Caesar, uh, came to us at the NDRC, the National Democratic Redistricting Committee, and said, we have been um, gerrymandered. Our, our campus is split. And as a result of what she brought to us, we filed a lawsuit in North Carolina and and won the case, and um, as a result, all the kids and they all vote together. But they are making it more difficult for um, for young people um, to vote. Thank you. Um, right here, yes. <laughs> we say that's not really Texas. <laughs> we are surrounded by Texas and, and more and more governed by the state. Um, city, cities, authorities are being um, succumbed. We've seen this for a long time, overshadowed, overtaken by the state. And it was really disturbing that uh, Roe, I actually thought maybe there was a secret uh, agenda to have the Roe decision overturned at the time in which we had enough time to, to organize. <coughs> Um, and get and people out to vote, and we just didn't see it. And I'm I'm a voter in Austin, and I will tell you that. Um, well, we first up, we see more and more women at the city council and the mayoral positions, but yet these fundamental rights are taken away. I've been interested in, in thoughts about that, but it cannot be overstated that waiting in line to vote is a reality today. It's and a I, it is a poll tax that very few people can afford to pay. People I mean, Um, <laughs> I, 
um, you know, we try as hard as we can to share information about staying in line and what your rights are and making sure people have access to that information, the hotlines to call. I mean, there are a lot of incredible organizations on the ground that are working to fight these voter ID laws that are, I mean, and it's going, I mean, the unfortunate part is it's just going to take time. Some of it is like, this is the consequence of elections, right? These are the people that were put in, and we, we had this great conversation with a congresswoman yesterday about, um, I think, Oregon? Um, and just how they, how much mail-in ballot yep. they have, and how you know they have their uh, secretary of state. I think is is a Republican, but it's this bipartisan, and it's worked fantastic. They have no issues, and they've built this incredible system. I I think it's just going to take time for us to put the right people in the positions to make sure that these voting rights are no longer restricted. And in the meantime, it's really up to everyone else to make sure. I mean, like we volunteer and we show up and we hand waters out and snacks out to people that are staying in line. We send pizzas, like we do everything that we can. Um, I don't think that that is gonna solve the exact problem that you're saying. Um, but I do think making sure that people understand their rights, that once they're in line, they have they can stay in line and they can vote. Um, it, it just things like that are always gonna be really you know, important. But it's interesting what you just said, you know, to keep people in line, pizzas and, and things to drink, things like that. And that's why Georgia puts in place this law that says yes. you can't, no it's, yes. it's a felony yeah. to give somebody water. You know, yes. When that law was first passed, it's like, well, what is this all about? And then you realize, well, wait a minute. If you close 1,700 polling places, which has happened since the uh, yeah. Shelby County case, and the lines get longer, well, you make it so that, let's make it as difficult as, as possible for people to stay in line. It doesn't mean everybody's going to get off the line, but if you reduce the number of people in line by one or two percent in these close elections, that can be election defining, you know, so. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a hard stop. We are finished. Could I ask for a round of applause for our panelists? <laughs>